other democracies, even compared to other democracies. Uh, balancing the right to a fair trial against freedom of speech, freedom of the press. How do you deal with this in a more or less borderless world of the internet? It's not easy. We don't understand the role. We're, we've moved away from privateers and letters of mark and reprisal, but we don't really know what to replace it with to regulate an international world. Let me ask the other panelists if they have uh, views on that. Who are the most important players when you think about these issues? When you do your own research and you look at privacy or data or machine learning, who is it you think about? Because it's probably not just governments. People. People. If we don't react, governments will not do anything about it, right? I mean, this yeah. is what we are trying to do in the European Union, to raise a voice as a community saying that privacy matters. But if I ask my 200 students in crypto course if they do care about privacy, they say no, because we don't have anything <laughs> to hide, right? Well, this is a country in the Netherlands. They have democracy, a level of uh, Western values. But this is an attitude I really don't like, because what we are designing, developing, implementing are used in other countries, in other contexts, and we are responsible for that. So people should really care. Educational institutions really should care about this fact, saying that what I'm designing, Facebook or Netflix, will be used in other countries, they, they might have some serious issues. So I think it is the people and we really need to educate our own people. Okay, Let's see if there are more questions. More questions, we got one. Uh, do we have over, okay, go ahead. Please identify yourself. Well, um, no, I don't think machine learning can break encryption. Um, that's my direct interpretation of your question. No, I don't think that is happening. At the same time, encryption is a mathematical thing. Designing a secure system based on encryption is very, very difficult. In fact, it's so difficult that we more often see people fail doing this than succeed doing this. So where machine learning could very well be helpful is in identifying vulnerabilities that do not actually involve breaking encryption. And in my experience, we have plenty of those to exploit. Well, nothing to add? Okay. Um, we have more questions. Let's, we'll come down the front here. We got one in the back. We got about seven minutes. Well, I can give you some odd historical examples. In the 17th century, the Japanese banned firearms because it was against the code of the samurai who lived and died by the sword. But if you ask me for serious examples where states have not used something in their competition with each other, uh, I find it hard to find examples before you actually have something awful which leads to a response in the examples I gave you with nuclear capital and so forth. And that's why when I got to cyber, which Sanger calls the perfect weapon on this uh, image of it as a you know, bloodless weapon, uh, it may not remain bloodless. And uh, that, uh, Bruce Schneier, for example, who's going to be speaking here, has argued that the big change in cyber will come when there are a lot of deaths. 
you know, 2,000 driverless cars which all go off the same bridge at this, uh, or several bridges at the same time and create a 9-11 type effect, then you might find a big change. Okay, uh, we had one, we'll go down the row. We had one in the middle. Go ahead. Well, it's true that uh, uh, nuclear technology and uh, the other technologies are, are very different from cyber technology. The question is, are there meta lessons we can learn from uh, the uh, how states developed caution or prudence or norms, but the technologies each present a different set of problems. There are some problems of attribution with nuclear, but we but there are so few states that we know that we can get a Krypton reading of who made the explosion, which isn't 100% reliable, but pretty liable. The question within attribution and retaliation in cyber uh, is it's very hard to get re attribution that would stand up in a court of law beyond reasonable doubt, and also to get it quickly. On the other hand, for the purposes of, of warfare, uh, there are ways to follow several hops beyond the stepping stone to the point where you say, I think I'm pretty sure you did this and I warned you and I am retaliating. So there's a difference between uh, uh, having no capacity to identify <coughs> a perpetrator and having a capacity which is good enough to stand up in a law court and having a capacity in between which is good enough for a degree of deterrence in warfare. I actually think attribution is a lot better today than most people credit it. Uh, there are a lot of techniques used, including not just cyber techniques, but other intelligence techniques. A lot of it is based on continuity of engagement with a particular actor and learning their patterns, learning their techniques, learning their tools, learning their infrastructure. The problem is you often can't disclose this. It's not that it couldn't stand up in a court of law, it's that you don't dare use it publicly because that makes it easier for somebody to hide. It's not perfect, it's slow, can only be done by well by a few players, especially national intelligence agencies. Uh, so I'm not particularly worried about one government knowing what has been done by another government. It's when you get to the grayer areas where you have more trouble. Is this particular hacker group that you've identified acting on behalf of some government as opposed to acting on behalf of, of itself. Let me ask the other panelists if they want to say anything about uh, attribution uh, identity, maybe the effect of uh, AI on it. Uh, yes, no, you don't want to talk about it. I, I'll tell you just as a general principle when I would advise the government for some countries, I'd say, well, we may not know it was them for sure, but let's just whack them on general principles, you know? <laughs> and that had a lot of appeal. How, define whack, however. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm super happy with the European Union. We have GDPR already, and uh, the, the privacy, uh, privacy, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, privacy is already protected, but cybersecurity incidents, uh, there's this uh, triple helix model at least uh, in the Netherlands, government, industry, and the knowledge institutions work together to solve these problems in, in collaboration. So it is not only government laws and regulations, but also the institutions training youngsters and high school kids about not to share your credit card number on a YouTube or so. 
And at the same time, industrial partners are really taking care of the technological parts. So I think it's a team game. So I'm not into the social aspects of cybersecurity. Sadly, I'm an applied cryptographer. But what I see, it is working. Maybe it is slower, but it is this triple helix model together with government institutions and the industry. Anything to add? Sure. OK, we had a question in the front. Uh, Mike Nelson with Cloudflare. Um, I'm going to end on a positive note here. <laughs> Steve, you did an incredible job of explaining stupid proposals from government on cybersecurity. I've worked with some of you for 30 years, stopping stupid stuff. But government has a really important role to play in protecting its own systems. We're in the DDoS protection business. We help governments protect themselves from DDoS attacks. But we're also trying to highlight where governments have systems that are being exploited for botnets. We see the world's DDoS traffic, and a lot of it's coming from governments that don't secure their own systems. So I'd ask you and anyone else in the panel, what can we do to make governments real leaders in using the leading edge cybersecurity uh, technology rather than contributing to the problem? The single biggest problem in government is system administration. The second biggest problem is that budgets for replacing an up, uh, outdated equipment are subject to the political process, and it becomes, always becomes easy when your parliament and your congress, what have you, is in a bad mood to postpone your upgrade for a year or two years. And you could put up with this for a year, maybe two. If you miss a major operating system release upgrade, you're in very big trouble. The fact that there were a number of US government agencies that had to pay Microsoft very large sums of money for custom support to Windows XP, when Microsoft had EOL to end of life, discontinued support for it after 13 years, uh, is a classic example of what I mean. A corporation can say, I'm going to depreciate this equipment over five years, say, and then I will replace it, and I'll happen to get the new one. If you get behind the technological eight ball on upgrades, what's Painful but routine becomes a major, major pro uh, project. So what governments have to do is concentrate on steady, predictable budgets and incentivizing system administration. Some of that comes to salary. People get a job as a system in the government, they learn their skill, and they go to the private sector for twice the pay. It's a bad situation. Uh, I agree with that, and I give you a particular example. When North Korea released WannaCry, it didn't intend to bring down the national health system of Britain. The problem was they were doing it for financial gain, uh, uh, but the problem is that the British Parliament, in a period of austerity, didn't do, it didn't do what Steve Elvin just said. So there's a, there's a case where essentially government failed. But, but I'd like to go back to something else that he said. I think government has an important role to play in changing the basic norm of liability. Uh, we have developed software on the principle of uh, innovate, break things, fix it, patch later, because that's, that will get us quicker change. The net effect of that is buggy software, and buggy software, you can say, yes, we issue patches, but not everybody patches or has the capacity to patch for the reasons that were just described. Changing the principles of liability is a governmental function, which, if it's done properly, will develop an insurance industry requiring the data which allows you to develop the actuarial tables. And if you get to an Internet of Things, uh, which is massive, I don't see how you're going to do it without changing liability and developing an insurance industry, and to develop that, you have to require disclosure of information. So I think this is a, uh, uh, I, I, what he had in his last slides, I think was exactly right. Uh, I just want to add, it is also not an easy job. Uh, my colleagues investigated uh, a factory, and they were like uh, devices aging of 50 years or so. 
So it's a combination of 40 different technologies, companies, all connected together for generating power. Patching or changing devices, it's not that easy. You need to come up with a system that will cover the whole security of the factory, but it is also very, very difficult. Either you really need to rebuild the factory or find some, some technological solutions. I'll take a contrary view. How about that? Say something controversial. Good. I actually think strict liability for those things is a terrible idea. <laughs> well, if there are any other, so in that? if there are well, any other industry reps who want to applaud, <laughs> here is why: there is value for society in rapid yeah, innovation, even if it comes with buggy software. You, each one of you, is holding like this little device, this little phone, with like unimaginably rich functionality. Like 20 years ago, somebody would tell you that you'd be holding this device, which has as much power as a supercomputer back in the day can communicate with anybody in the world, browse the internet, uh, talk to anybody on social networks and so on. There is huge value for that and so on, for society and for humanity. Yes, it comes with bugs, bugs get exploited, we get attacks all the time. You know what, I've been in this business for more than 20 years, I keep hearing about attacks and yet, like, I'm still here, we're all still here, like the world survives. There is a trade-off here between like, Everybody should be liable for bugs they introduce versus let's just build things fast and it's going to get exploited, it's going to get broken, it's going to get patched, we're going to move to the next thing. So there is value to both. Just to keep things lively. Okay. I'm getting a signal, but I can't figure out what it is. Oh, okay, good. Now I figured it out. So I, uh, there's some useful things here that I think we can pick up from each of the speakers. Um, I like Joe's comment about big countries do what they must and little countries just have to suffer. Uh, that is really a good model for international relations. Um, <laughs> I like Steve's remark about painful but necessary. That might describe our topic. Um, I like the remark about how the, the core constituency in some ways is the people. I mean, I, I hope we don't forget that sometimes. And finally, the, the discussion of innovation, I, it's a fair point that the losses, although they're constantly talked about, may still be outweighed by the gains. And when you think about the supercomputer that some of us used in the 80s, uh, now less powerful by a magnitude in the phones you have in your pockets, maybe that makes it worthwhile. Maybe we should back off a little bit. So it's been a fascinating panel, and please join me in thanking them.